in. We're going to wait another minute as participants join the webinar before we start. So again, welcome to the World Oregon webinar and we'll give it another minute or so before we start the program. My name is Derek Olson. I'm the president of World Oregon. It's an honor to have you here with us today for uh, one in a series of virtual programs. Uh, for those of you who have not joined in on one of our virtual programs before, we're using the platform of Zoom, Zoom webinar, where all um, attendees' audio and video is off. Only the uh, panelists um, will have their video and audio on. You can ask questions or uh, comments in the chat or Q&A. Um, uh, options below, uh, especially the Q&A, we would recommend for questions for the speaker, Dr. Burroughs. Those will be monitored by Program Director Tim DeRoche, who will be moderating questions later on in the program. We are recording today's presentation so that we, we may post it on YouTube later for others who are unable to join it live. So um, mind your P's and Q's. And um, we really appreciate you joining in and for supporting World Oregon. As uh, most of you know, but some may not, World Oregon is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. And we're supported by uh, attendees like you, uh, as well as supportive foundations and partners and universities and corporations who uh, want to support our mission connecting World Oregon, uh, excuse me, connecting Oregon with the world through our programs. Uh, there's a great chance for all of you to get engaged with that. We're having our upcoming annual fundraiser on June 27th. It's a virtual fundraiser, WorldQuest, uh, and we encourage you to join in on that. Um, and also hope that you will join us next week when we have a great series of programs lined up later this week and next on other topics related to the world in the age of COVID-19. And now without further ado, today's program. Today's program is entitled, We Saw It Coming, Foresight, Policy, and Three COVID-19 Scenarios with Dr. Matthew J. Burroughs of the Atlantic Council. We're excited to be partnering with the Atlantic Council on this event, a partnership that comes out of our leadership of our trustee, Ambassador Mary Carlin Yates, uh, who will be introducing the speaker. Um, Ambassador Yates, uh, retired Foreign Service Officer, sits on the uh, board of the Atlantic Council, uh, one of the leading think tanks in Washington, D.C., and we've had a number of great programs with uh, Atlantic Council experts. This is part of that. And we're thrilled to be doing another one. Uh, Ambassador Yates is going to uh, talk a little bit about our partnership, how the two of them met, and then we'll pass it over to Dr. Burroughs uh, for an invigorating program and your Q&A. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, fantastic trustee, Ambassador Mary Carlin Yates, to take it from here. Thank you, Derek, um, and thanks to World Oregon for having this program and giving me the honor of introducing Dr. Matt Burroughs. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing Matt uh, and his profound thinking since 2009, and that was when I had just joined the White House, the National Security Council of President Obama. Uh, Matt was at the NIC at the, at the time, the National Intelligence Council, and my new job was Special Assistant to the President for Strategic Planning. So our first meeting, Matt briefed me on the document, uh, Global Trends 2025, uh, which had been published in 2008. And this document and Matt opened my eyes to sort of visionary thinking that came out of the doc document from black swans to the opening of the Arctic, uh, to demographic discord like the youth bulge in Africa. But he also, at that point in 2009, had, they had dedicated a page to the possibility of a global pandemic. And certainly from my work in Africa, I knew about AIDS, I knew about Ebola. In fact, we were in the Congo in 94 when the outbreak happened. And you remember the movie in 1995 with Dustin Hoffman outbreak? Well, they were wearing the first PPE I think I ever saw. Um, but conceptually, we might have known about pandemics, that they were out there, but somehow we didn't think they were going to reach our shores. But Matt Burroughs did. Prescient, yes. A leader in foresight thinking, yes, absolutely. Matt Burroughs is a quiet scholar who thinks deeply and has worked in the field of foresight and global trends analysis for decades. He graduated from Cambridge University with a PhD in European history. He served as an analyst for the Directorate of Intelligence at the CIA. 
He was a special assistant to UN Ambassador Richard Holbrook, and he was a Deputy National Security Advisor to US Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill, amongst his many, many distinguished accomplishments. And when he left government service in the fall of 2013, I was thrilled that the Atlantic Council grabbed him to head up their new directorate called Foresight, Strategy, and Risks Initiative. Um, this was after he had just finished Global Trends 2030 uh, Alternative Worlds. And in that, there was an entire chapter dedicated uh, to a worldwide uh, pandemic. I know a lot of friends are scrambling to reread that chapter now. Who better to present to us today than Matt Burroughs in the comments, we saw it coming, foresight policy and three COVID scenarios. Over to you, Matt. Well, thank you, Mary. It's been a long time, I mean, a decade, and I had hoped that we would never see a global pandemic because that was one of the worst futures that you could have. And unfortunately, it has um, now been a, it's a fact, and we're seeing the scenario play out right in front of our eyes. So I'm delighted to be here um, to talk to everybody. Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, what little bit about the future, what comes next, and uh, particularly thinking about the global, much more the, the global um, developments, how this will affect the world. I'm gonna share my screen and with everybody and I wanna talk a little bit about the different scenarios that I see. Um, So here we go. So, you know, this is a photo out of the pandemic in 1918. Um, you see the uh, New York, New York's finest uh, with masks. Um, of course, there it's actually in the winter, so they have coats on, but it's not that far from, from what we saw um, over the past few months. Now pandemics, and I think you've been already, you know, people have talked about it. Pandemics oftentimes are turning points. You know, it's one of the factors, if you go way back to classical uh, Greece, one of the factors in Athens to, uh, defeat against Sparta. Obviously, it was one of the big, you know, plagues and pandemics were one of the big factors at the very beginning of the discovery of, of America. It wiped out uh, millions of, of native um, populations, um, which laid the, the groundwork actually for the Spanish and Portuguese conquest of Latin America. Um, you could also see some good you know, effects of it. If you go back to the Black Death, which was probably one of the most devastating, it actually led to the end of feudalism, uh, particularly in, in Great Britain, because obviously now the labor, you know, the lords needed lots of peasants. They didn't have that many. They had to give them some rights. So, what we're trying to think now is what is going to be the impact over the next, um, not out 15 years like I used to do with the global trends, but out three or four or five years in the future. And before we get into that story, we got to keep in mind that there's huge amount of uncertainties with this um, pandemic. And we still don't know as much about the coronavirus as we would like. And so there are, you know, it's, I'd say three key variables. So variables means really uncertainties going forward. And first is the, the real timing of when we can get some therapies. We do have um, some on the horizon that appear to mitigate some of the effects, the, some of the negative effects of the coronavirus. And obviously we're waiting for a vaccine and there are various different estimates of that. Um, you know, 
if we get one within 12 months, yeah, actually we'll set a record because it's taken in most cases far longer to get vaccines, this goes including Ebola. Um, so, but we have lots of people working on it um, uh, across the world. So the potential there um, is, is, is greater for getting one sooner. And then the second thing is the ability to reopen the economy. As you'll see, one of the big issues with this pandemic is that it's actually a series of crises. There's a health crisis, um, there's an economic crisis, there's in the developing world a food crisis that's starting to happen, and also an energy crisis for those energy producers who rely on revenues from, from oil and gas, from selling oil and gas. The final thing is, uh, you know, in most of these pandemics, we've seen second and third waves. Uh, Dr. Fauci said the other day that anybody who thinks that we're not going to have a second wave uh, doesn't know much about pandemics. You know, we could not have the blanket lockdowns if we take some of the lessons from the Asians who have handled this much better. Um, and that is to do a lot more testing, a lot more, um, contact tracing um, so that we can do much more um, micro uh, lockdowns not affecting the, the economy. So if you're looking at, you know, how does this compare, um, you know, we, it looks like it's going to compare almost to the Great Depression, perhaps not quite as much, but you know, anywhere close, it's certainly more than any of the uh, crises that we've had right back to the 1930s. And so if we look at unemployment, um, you know, the Congressional Budget Office recently put out a uh, report saying that we could see up to um, uh, 15% um, you know, in this, in this period up to now and that, con that continuing right through the end of 2020 and over time reducing to 8.6. Now this isn't half the, this is only half the picture because if you look at who is going to suffer the most and we've seen evidence of this I think already in the protests, it is minority groups that are shedding jobs much more, um, that have shed jobs a lot more rapidly um, and are likely to be the ones that will have the slowest um, recovery in terms of getting those jobs back. Um, and this looks increasingly like it's going to be the next two, at least through 2021. Um, we'll still have high unemployment, at least compared to where we were in February. If you look at, you know, who has been hit hardest, and of course, obviously, this, this is a bit of a moving picture because we don't know how the recovery is going to happen in the second half. If you have a second wave, then you could see actually little or no recovery then. But on the present course, you're seeing Western countries, I would say Europe particularly being hurt, but the US as well. Compare that to um, China, they will be hit in the sense that they have never seen such low growth figures and they could also have negative growth and you have some of the developing countries also in, in general also uh, being heard in that they will have very, very low growth. Um, I'm gonna skip over some of the, the, the written stuff and, um, and we can talk a little bit about this in the, in the Q&A. I wanted to look at the energy crisis particularly here that we've seen such a drop in energy demand. 
Now that was aggravated by the fact that the Saudis and the Russians decided to, to try to compete over who could produce the most just at the offset, onset of the um, coronavirus crisis here. That shot the energy um, prices down even farther. But obviously the big factor here is energy demand and that won't recover until you see a broader economic recovery. We have seen some recovery in the last month or two. Um, and obviously China is, is out on front in terms of increasing manufacturing, which usually raises energy demand. This, the impact here is really on the producers, not so much like Saudi, although they, they're taking a huge hit, but they have lots of reserves. It's the countries here, particularly the Algerias, the Iraqs, Libyas, and others that live um, because of their revenues and do not actually have many in terms of budget reserves. Um, and you have to think about, you know, this crisis is happening now, but the effects are going to be over the next couple years. If you think back to the 2008 financial crisis, it was a factor in the Arab Spring, which ha occurred a couple years later. And what we have to be thinking about, and this is why we do forecasting, is thinking not just about the immediate effects uh, of a crisis, but what are the things that are going to, to happen down the road because of the pressures that have been put on a country now. One of them is for the energy producers, this is going to be very difficult to, to to basically recover from. They also, most of these countries are at the same time um, having, a, a, having to deal with the flight of international capital away from their countries. Um, and this happened really before coronavirus um, uh, started to, to affect um, developing countries. The worst affected so far, but this is not the end of the story, is Latin America. And in most cases, you're looking for, a, a, you know, particularly Brazil, Peru, Chile, Ecuador, very hard hit. Some of those countries are likely to, to see a Great Depression. Um, and because they don't, the international market is going to be wary of investment, they, they actually uh, face an additional hurdle. The U.S. has an advantage. It can pull in uh, foreign investment. In these countries, Latin America, other developing world countries, it's going to be difficult. Now, the IMF has stepped in to an extent, tried to, to help. Um, but it is, it's, it, it can't, that sort of aid can't do everything. And what the hope would be that the governments actually can begin to use the crisis as the South Koreans use the Asian financial crisis to actually lay the groundwork for reform and, you know, bounce over time, bounce out of it actually stronger. The other part of this, and we're going to be seeing that also in the next few months, is the growing food insecurity. I think, you know, if you've been following the news in India, for example, there was a lockdown that was put in place about a month, a little over a month ago. Um, it was done very quickly, and as a result, there was huge disruption of food supplies. Um, and particularly migrant workers who were forced out of the city, moving back um, to, their, to their villages. Um, they didn't necessarily, and they don't have many savings, obviously. Um, they were um, 
lots of them on their trip back didn't have money for any food and they, they walked two or three days without food. So you're seeing a disruption, many cases not linked to, you know, usually you have food crises that are linked to climate and weather. These are actually linked to the cut in transportation. There was, you know, the authorities in some of these states thought that basically they should prohibit trucks coming in with food deliveries. Um, so you had total disarray, which is what you what will cause the food crisis in this situation. You also will, once you begin to have a food crisis in one country, there tends to be hoarding by um, other countries who, uh, who uh, you know, the uh, producers or the exporters of, of food uh, because of their own worries about lacking sufficient supplies. Now we're coming to three scenarios and I'll walk through these um, and there's probably too much text here. I can uh, go back and stop the, sh the sharing. Um, and there are two of these are not very good scenarios. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's very hard to, to, in my mind, make up a positive scenario here. So the first one is, I think, the scenario that we are on, and that is the great accelerator downward. So if you think about the trend lines that were happening before this, this crisis, and that was slowdown in globalization, increasing protectionism, seen not just you know, between the US and China, but also across the world. Um, increased tensions, particularly in the U.S.-China uh, relationship. Um, slowdowns, particularly after 2000 in, in Europe and frictions between East and West and North and South. Also generally a slowdown in global growth, which affected developing countries. Uh, worries by the middle classes in those countries about slipping back into poverty. So all of those factors were there and what the pandemic seems to be doing, and this would be the base case scenario, is just accelerating them. So we've seen increasing tensions coming out of the pandemic and linked directly to the pandemic between US and China. Um, and actually the barbs being thrown back and forth are, are, are getting up to the real vicious level. You've also seen in Europe, um, really these, the southern poor countries, Italy, Spain, um, actually being hit a lot more. Um, China coming in and helping with medical supplies when, when the northern European countries didn't actually help as much, so resentments building up. And you've had over time, you've seen a lot of Chinese investment in, in Eastern European countries. So there was these divisions that existed already and have for some time, and then they seem to be opening up. Now what has happened, and this doesn't necessarily go along with the great accelerator downward, this is Europe for once in terms of the amount of, of stimulus that they're providing, they're actually um, doing more than any other uh, entity. China isn't doing much. The US has done a lot, but not quite up to the level of Europe. And there is a scheme actually for the, by the French and Germans to help even more by allowing the EU Commission to borrow funds. Now, this is a really a new, you say, integration level that, it, that we have not seen before. So in that one instance, we're not seeing actually what you would expect of more and more divisions. And as we've talked about with the energy, the food crisis, you have seen in the developing world, with the exception of 
Asians, so China, Korea, Japan, who managed to, to really control the, the crisis, the pandemic in their countries, with the exception of those countries, um, you've seen in the developing world real difficulty in managing um, the pandemic. They'll, their health system is very stretched and you've, their economic situation, as we've talked about, will, will take a hit, accelerating what we had already seen as a slowdown in growth. Second one is the one that people worry about in Washington a lot, and that is the China first scenario. So this is a China that moves ahead because it comes out quickly, manages to get part way up uh, in terms of getting its economy back, getting a recovery going. But also it begins in, to reactivate its planning on Belt and Road. So this is where the US and Europe, because they're so inwardly focused, don't pay enough attention to those really struggling in the developing world. And in that sense, the, the two, China really, uh, it's standing prestige in, in the developing world, not in the Western world, which I think China has taken a real hit but in a lot of the places um, that they have been investing in infrastructure, their China standing actually gets, gets boosted. Um, so this is the world headed towards bipolarism in the sense that you have a Western world that, that because it's struggling more inward um, is, is not, actually paying attention to what's happening in the developing world and a China that, that um, sees an opportunity here to, to, to boost its, its influence. The final one would be the one that, that we would all want. It's in some ways, you know, crises, if you look back to World War I, World War II, they can go in good or bad directions. Uh, we have examples there. Um, First World War, probably the example where, not probably, but is the example of, of um, uh, completely allowing the, the crisis to make things worse and to lay the groundwork for the Second World War. After the Second World War, you actually have ability to think differently in part because of the heirs after the uh, First World War and the US was right there to, to take the lead to think about multilateral institutions, um, to ensure that you know, it wasn't just the US that, that, uh, that recovered, but also helped Europe through the Marshall Plan. So in the third scenario that is, is really, this kind of scenario where you would actually see, and I call this a renaissance, is where we go back to an older playbook where you've seen a lot of the institutions, global institutions, diminish in importance, not play a particularly strong role. You actually, in this scenario, get an uh, institution, and this would have to be a revamp, WHO, that is focused on the, getting the vaccine and getting the vaccine so that everybody in the world is, is, is actually vaccinated. But the second part of this is you're arming the WHO to prevent any further pandemics. And this would be that they would really have teeth in a way that they did not or didn't feel that they had during this pandemic and be able to sanction countries, go in and, and, and really inspect um, to see what, what potential, um, you know, human to human transmission of viruses could occur and really alert the world and really push countries to take actions. 
Now, I envision as well, if you get to a point where people think that these global challenges such as pandemics are really very important to human existence, that they also take a leaf out of fighting the pandemic to also try to fight climate change, try to fight state failure, so that basically in this scenario, the fight against pandemic leads to more and more multilateral action on these bigger global challenges. It doesn't eliminate, I don't think, you know, what we're seeing with US-China competition and growing tensions, but it does bring cooperation back into the picture uh, where it hasn't. And, you know, all the, the two other scenarios, China first and acce uh, acceleration downward, all lead to, you could say, a conflict. Um, which is not what we want. This only through cooperation, which can help to, to diminish some of the competition, can you really see a world in, in which is, ends up being a much better one, taking the lessons from the, what we have gone through with the pandemic um, and trying to use those lessons to build a, a future world. I wish I could say that that was the path we're headed on. I think we're much more on the first one, uh, but you know, it's the early days. So um, I hope that we can think about ways that we can push towards the third one um, and uh, eliminate the first one. And with that, I'll turn it back to um, the organizers here. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Burroughs. This is uh, Tim DeRoche, the Director of Programs for World Oregon. And I'm wondering, you touched on this a little bit, um, but with the sort of withdrawal from multilateral organizations, I mean, most recently the WHO, um, and you know, the sort of uh, digging in the heels of, 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 of an America first, uh, what's your assessment of how we can begin to engage and, and, and in fact lead on this um, globally coming out of it? Well, I think we have to be realistic that, you know, I don't see a Trump administration actually being able to do it uh, because I think they, you know, they have a very uh, narrow um, idea of U.S. interests. Um, and, you know, if you want to get into multilateralism, you actually have to think that your interests are better served and better protected by working with others um, who also, you know, will end up also being in a better place. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen just not with the leaving of the WHO, but you, it's been a long series of, of Trump administration decisions to get out of international agreements. So the one on Iran, the Paris Climate Agreement, I, you know, the list is, is pretty long. And, and their philosophy, I mean, in their heads, they cannot understand how you get to a better place through, through multilateralism. As I said, I think, you know, the American public um, and I, when I worked up at the UN, I mean, under uh, Richard Holbrook, and those were the days when there was the battle over the budget um, and Congress not wanting to um, pay the, the, the membership dues of the UN, that you've had a public kind of turning away, particularly in that case from the UN, so this would have to be an effort. I mean, as Holbrook was quite effective when he was there, he got members of the Senate to come up to be in the Security Council to actually, you know, get a much more favorable view of what the UN was, was doing. And I mean, the UN is a huge organization with all these agencies that we don't even think too much about, but really do play a very important role in some of these 
like on food and um, children and all, all sorts of issue peacekeeping as well. So it's actually to try to, I think, put these organizations on a, on a much better footing and deal, I mean, you, you have to deal with some issues the developing world feels that doesn't have adequate representation. And that's part of why they, they um, uh, you know, don't want to get too invested in it. I think there will have to be some pressure on China to, to join in because in a way, China has the same idea on sovereignty that the Trump administration does. I mean, that you don't try to pool sovereignty. The Europeans, for the most part, I mean, multilateralism is how they deal with their own problems, so they're much more used to it. Um, and they have one problem is that there's too much representation on the Security Council. So um, compared to the Africa or, or uh, Latin America or South, A South Asia that doesn't have any representation. So, you know, I think it would take a, uh, a leader to do this. Um, and also it would be messy work. I mean, this is kind of like making sausage. I mean, this is, this would be have to be a four, eight year uh, effort, effort, so. Well, to sort of piggyback on that, you, you, you just, um, you, you, you basically uh, touched on the next question, which is from Spencer. Um, assuming an administrative change in January, this is a little bit like one of those choose your own adventure books. So if you go <laughs> X, you get X, Y, and Z attached to it. But how long may it take for the US to successfully re-engage and to really build back the trust um, in multilateral institutions? Well, I think on the in the case of most of the Europeans, um, they're very anxious for a different, <laughs> a different kind of America than they see at the moment. So, and there are throughout the developing world, there are also countries who are very anxious for the for the U.S. to go down a more traditional path. Um, I do think that you know there are there's high level of distrust obviously Russia, China, um, and that you're not going to dissipate all of that, but you have to build a relationship in which you have a working relationship, you can, you can actually uh, engage. Um, and that, that will be difficult, but I think you could, you know, there's advantages here for, for China as, as well. Um, I do think it it means, you know, and Mary probably is better placed than, than me to talk about this, is that we do have to engage again in the developing world and on their terms, trying to think about just not um, terrorism where we've always been strong, but also understanding what their, what their development needs. And, you know, foreign aid is not popular at all, this is, uh, and the public thinks that we provide a lot more aid than we actually do. Um, so this would be a, a president making the case that, that, you know, we need to be outward facing, engage a lot, and actually try to, in the same way we did after the Second World War, think about how you, you, um, can help others. Now, I think part of it may be, you know, the pre a new president would probably have to sell it as well. China's too entrenched. This is a way that the U.S. to counter it at the same time holding back on making this into a, a new Cold War, which I think would be very damaging to both sides. You know, when we look at sort of crisis management, oftentimes you know, there are the unintended consequences, and then there are sometimes um, unlikely allies. And one of the interesting threads I've been seeing pop up is, as we begin to move out of this, um, what might be the Venn diagram between, say, a COVID-19 response and climate change, for instance? And Veronica wonders, 
with the decrease in energy demand for oil and gas, to what extent does this provide an opening for alternative or more friendly climate solutions to grow? It does provide an opening, um, but I think it needs a push by, you could say, governments or communities, maybe not necessarily national government, uh, but you know, state government. I think California has been very good on this. Um, traditionally, if you go back when you've had these uh, recessions, so when energy demand has gone down, um, that the the green energies don't necessarily do well in those circumstances. Um, sometimes because green energy is is higher priced, um, so that people feel well, you know, oil down at twenty dollars a barrel, thirty dollars. I mean, uh, and we're paying I don't, my area, you know, below two dollars per gallon. Uh, so why should we sh switch? Um, but I think you can get a lot of incentives so that that happens. I think there's much more of a consciousness that we should be using this opportunity actually to to move towards um, much more green energy. Um, it's certainly, hopefully, you know, these kind of big events like pandemic should help us to think that, you know, while that climate change could come just as fast and could be just as devastating. I think there is a sense, and, and this is, you know, one of the things that we struggled with, and I know Mary struggled with, is that it's hard to get people to be active on, on things like this unless that they actually see it. And we've learned in this crisis, unfortunately, that we waited far too long to take strong action. So maybe that can translate, and, but I think it would have to be under an, another president into let's take strong action um, against climate change. So Daniel, uh, so much question. He said, I'd like to learn from Dr. Burroughs which sources of information and updates he believes are reliable and worth following, of course, other than the Atlantic Council? Um, well, in terms of, of um, you know, media, um, I think the Financial Times is, is excellent. Um, I, you know, I glean lots of things from IMF World Bank reports, um, McKinsey, also does very good economic analysis, uh, both on the US and, and uh, overseas. Um, and, you know, think tanks themselves generate, you know, not just the Atlantic Council, but um, there's incredible amount of knowledge being generated, you know, out of different uh, think tanks, Brookings, um, you know, I think it produces some of the, the best um, reports, um, but you have a lot of other think tanks as well. And you have the, um, for the economic, and you saw one of the graphs there was the Inter International Institute of Finance, which does superb studies on, on, on economics, which is not here, but as its name would, would suggest on, on the whole globe. So, um, but you know, if you look at the FT, I say the economists um, would be another, it oftentimes talks about these reports so you don't have to discover them on your own. Um, so as someone who's involved in foresight planning and scenario planning, that kind of world could probably often feel like you're a, you know, a. Hollywood sci-fi screenwriter, but I'm curious, how do you stay inspired and hopeful in doing the work you do? Well, I, you know, we've had huge success um, over the last few decades. Uh, I wrote a whole bunch of articles. I think it was about the time when Mary, and I were first getting introduced to each other 
on the global middle class. This is where you, you know, or the world is moving quickly to eliminate extreme poverty, or at least it was before the pandemic. Um, you've seen some, you know, amazing strides that that a lot of these very poor countries have taken. You've seen also this middle classes, it's not in China, but Africa, India, Latin America, really put effort into educating both sons and daughters. I mean, if you look at the educational statistics, what is really, you know, wonderful is the fact you don't, you're diminishing those opportunities that were solely for, 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 for boys and young men are now girls too have those opportunities. And in some countries you're, you're seeing, you know, as you are in this country, you're seeing actually girls do much better academically. So that's a, you know, if you want to get some faith in what is happening, and that's a lot of it is a result of, of parents this global middle class investing in their children's um, uh, education. Somebody once said, you know, if you look at the first four pages of the New York Times and compare them to the Times of India, what you see, you know, the, the looking at the advertisements is in the New York Times, it tends to be luxury shops, Hermes or Chanel. In the Times of India, it's all about tutorials and colleges that you can send your kids to so they can get in the best uh, university. So, you know, I think that is, for me, that's a really inspiring story. Um, and one that means that, you know, despite the problems that, that we're seeing, um, that you have people that, that are much better educated and are going to actually help steer this crisis in a in a much more positive direction. Well, Dr. Burroughs, thanks for your incredibly thoughtful and well-researched um, work. Um, I, it's a lot of things. It's hard to move past often the headline and the and the noise and the news. And it was some wonderful, wonderful factual information. I just posted a link in the chat to people if they would like to learn more about your work and read some of your recent writings. Uh, a couple of recent articles are extremely excellent. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And I'm going to turn it back over to Derek Olson to close us out and send us on our merry way. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Dr. Burroughs, again, for a fantastic uh, discussion uh, with our community on these issues. Thank you, Ambassador Yates, for uh, introducing him. Uh, if it's these issues that uh, we talked about today pique more interest, we're going to dive into even greater detail in Latin America. Tomorrow, we have a program on COVID-19 in Latin America with a diplomat in residence at Yale University, who used to be the acting uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America. Uh, Paco Palmieri, that is tomorrow at noon. Um, and then some other programs we have coming up, our young professionals are leading a Long Reads Club uh, article on the twilight of the Iranian revolution, that's Sunday. Um, and then next week, a couple fascinating programs. One is more uh, lighthearted, um, good flag, bad flags, what flags mean and why they matter with a local vexillologist here. Um, if any of you, you have seen um, Sheldon Cooper's Fun With Flags uh, on uh, Big Bang Theory, it's kind of like that in a local expert. Uh, so that'll be fun next Tuesday afternoon. It's an afternoon program. Uh, and then uh, on the 11th over noon, we have uh, Preventing the Next Pandemic, the intersection uh, of um, wildlife and uh, human life. And that's with our partners at the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance. So some really great programs. These are all free for World Oregon members. Again, if you're not a member, we encourage you to renew your membership online at worldoregon.org. <coughs> Dr. Burroughs, thank you again. Thank you to you and oh, your my pleasure. council. Absolutely. For all those out in the community, have a great day and we'll see you at our next program. Bye. Bye-bye.